So in the last video, we spoke about challenges uh, with modeling defaults with classical financial models. And if we summarize it, we can simply say that the GBA model uh, directly contradicts the data because it doesn't admit, admit defaults. Uh, you don't even have to compare uh, predictions uh, of the model versus actual stock uh, volatility patterns as is usually uh, done in empirical tests of the GBM model. The model misses something very important, namely defaults, and therefore it cannot be a complete model as a matter of principle. Uh, true defaults are rare events, uh, but uh, they are critically important for functioning of financial markets. If you use the JBM model or similar model uh, uh, for stocks, you need to use uh, something else, uh, such as credit spread models, to incorporate credit risk. And uh, some sort of uh, account for credit risk is important for trading in, uh, at almost every time horizon, excluding possibly only a very short uh, time horizon trading, uh, intraday trading. So as uh, uh, we see, if uh, we have a mathematical model with a simple formulation, it doesn't mean yet uh, that it's simple to use in practice or that it's, uh, all conclusions uh, make sense. Uh, so not to contribute to a century uh, a long discussion of uh, whose methods are better, I cannot resist uh, here a temptation to tell a joke uh, I read recently on that topic. And the joke is about a biologist, a physicist, and a mathematician uh, who sit at the bar and observe uh, two people entering a house across the street. And after a while, uh, three people emerge uh, from the house uh, and leave. And then the biologist uh, says, uh, the population has replicated. And the physicist says, uh, it's an error in the measurement. And the mathematician uh, says, if now another person enters the house, uh, it will have exactly zero number of people inside. So, uh, okay, coming back to finance, uh, we spoke in this lesson and the previous ones about challenges uh, of financial modeling uh, when using the classical concepts of uh, competitive market equilibrium and uh, related models such as the geometric Brownian motion, CAPM, uh, or the Black-Scholes option pricing model. And recall that a market in this approach is assumed to be insulated from the outside world as it doesn't receive any new money or new information from it. Yet the GBM model essentially predicts that in this world uh, assets will grow indefinitely uh, large. Also, the very existence of uh, the market is not explained in the competitive market equilibrium models, uh, but uh, instead is just postulated. I have already mentioned uh, an alternative paradigm uh, to how markets uh, can function called equilibrium-disequilibrium, uh, which was a term suggested by Amihut and co-workers in 2005. In this picture, a market has a continuous access uh, to new capital and new information. Market makers provide liquidity in an amount which is optimal for them, uh, which impacts market prices. Investors invest or withdraw capital from the market again in an amount uh, that is optimal for them. And everything moves. The only thing uh, that is equilibrium about uh, this is that it looks um, more or less uh, the same pretty much all the time. And in physics, uh, this is called a steady non-equilibrium state. Now, uh, what we will do next uh, is consider a model that can implement such a state of equilibrium uh, disequilibrium in the market. Uh, the model uh, has to do with what we discussed in the last week of our course on reinforcement learning and also to what you did in your uh, course project for this course. So let's uh, let XT be a total market capitalization of a firm. 
And uh, for convenience, we can scale uh, these by an average market cap uh, over the whole observation uh, period, uh, for example. So uh, we can think of xt as a dimensionless uh, variable whose values uh, would be on average of the order of 1. And uh, now we can consider a discrete time dynamics uh, described in equation 17 shown here. These are essentially the same equations that uh, we used in our previous course uh, when we considered various portfolio optimization problems. Previously, XT was, uh, was a total um, dollar value of a stock position in an individual uh, investor portfolio. And U sub T was a change uh, of this position in asset at the beginning of the time interval T uh, from T to T plus delta T. Uh, now, uh, the equations are the same, uh, but because we apply them to the market as a whole, the meaning is different. Now, XT uh, stands for the uh, total market cap of, uh, of the firm, while U sub T is the total injection or withdrawal, uh, uh, depending on the sign of money, in the market at time T. So the first equation says that uh, the price process is determined by first a new injection of money UT in the market in the beginning of the interval T uh, to T plus delta T, and then the new value XT plus UT grows at the rate uh, RT. And the formula for the rate RT is given uh, in the second equation where RF is the risk free rate, uh, Z, uh, T are signals, uh, W are their weights, and the term mu times UT describes linear market frictions, so that uh, mu is a friction coefficient. Now, please note that uh, the money supply UT can also be zero here in a particular period, uh, or negative for that sake, in a particular period or in all periods uh, altogether. Now, note that if we set uh, UT equal uh, zero in these equations, uh, identically, we exactly recover the uh, geometric Brownian motion model. But what if we want to keep uh, u t uh, different from zero? What should we uh, use for it then? Well, in general, uh, u t uh, is the amount of money that uh, the outside investors put or uh, withdraw from the market depending on the market conditions and uh, an outlook. So it should depend on the market value x t Plus, it can depend on other things such as uh, signal ZT. Uh, we can take a simplest uh, functional form for UT uh, as a function of XT that is shown here in equation 18. It says that UT can be taken as a quadratic function uh, of XT with a zero intercept. We can view uh, this function as either a low order Taylor expansion of some other more complex function, or alternatively, we can view it as a, uh, some sort of a utility function of outside investors in the market, uh, which would be similar in spirit to the picture of equilibrium, disequilibrium of Amihud and co workers. Now, if we assume that uh, parameter lambda is positive but very small, then uh, the behavior of function ut will be mostly driven by the first term as long as xt is much smaller than um, the ratio uh, of uh, phi over lambda. And if parameter phi is larger than zero, money is uh, pumped in the market and otherwise money is withdrawn from the market. Now, if you uh, take uh, this expression for your team and, and substitute it in our equations uh, 17, then uh, draw up terms uh, which are proportional to delta t squared and then proceed to a continuous time limit, uh, you will get the equation 20 and uh, because uh, 
uh, equation, uh, this equation describes uh, a di dynamics in the spirit of uh, the picture drawn by Ami Hood and co-workers. I call uh, this uh, dynamics quantum equilibrium, disequilibrium uh, model. And uh, the meaning of word quantum will be uh, more clear a bit later. Uh, but looking at the equation, uh, it has four parameters. Uh, if you don't count the weights of the signals as it is. So the parameters would be sigma, kappa, theta, and g. And the three new parameters, g, uh, kappa, and theta, are defined here in equation 21. So now if we keep the sign of mu positive, uh, the mean reversion parameter kappa here can be of either sign depending on the sign of phi and the value of lambda. So by playing with uh, uh, different combinations and values of uh, these parameters, you can actually obtain uh, lots of very interesting dynamics. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something that we'll be doing the next week. See you then.